Thank you so much. So uh, another another topic here for session four, where we really are in it together and, and need to be together, I think, to make progress. So thank you for that great session. Um, really excited to be uh, moderating this session here today. Thank you, Dr. Palaniapin and Dr. Lin and everyone at the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and Education for organizing this. I know it's not an easy thing to do to bring all these folks together across the world um, um, and when everyone's uh, busy, but you've done an amazing job of, of bringing folks together on this really important topic. Um, and I think, you know, what we want to do today uh, is think about, uh, in this session, health disparities and, you know, noting that health disparities have been recognized for centuries. It's not anything new. Uh, but there has been a really new and deserved level of attention with COVID. Um, the exacerbation of disparities in the U.S. Uh, across a number of domains has been really dramatic. Um, and there has been more broad-based concern for these disparities among communities not affected. So among affected communities in, in the U.S., this is not a surprise. It's something uh, people have been living with their whole lives uh, among their, their friends um, and in their communities. Um, but now I think there's more people in the U.S. from outside those communities who have a concern about health disparities. So uh, it's a real opportunity here to do something, not just for COVID, not just right now, uh, but for the future to, um, to address health disparities. Uh, it's, it's interesting to think a little bit about um, how far we've come, even just recently in that recognition. If we think at health, the healthy people objectives, uh, Healthy People 2000, the goal was to reduce disparities. Um, you know, we've come a long way from then thinking about, you know, that's not enough. We want to eliminate disparities and thinking about what they mean. So fast forward to Healthy People 2020, um, health disparities were defined as a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. And then importantly, in part of that definition in 2020, historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. So really focusing on the root causes of health disparities. Now in 2030, with the health, health, uh, Healthy People 2030, we're moving to actions on social determinants of health to reduce health equity. So while equity in the healthcare system is absolutely important and essential to talk about, COVID has really brought an increased focus on influences outside the healthcare system and the need to address that. So we'll have about an hour here for this uh, session um, to reflect on what we know uh, for thinking about what we can be doing now and in the future. I'm really excited to have these five speakers with us today to share their thoughts um, and their experiences. So we have a question and answer box. Um, and I really invite you to um, think as we're going through, each speaker is just gonna have five minutes. It's gonna be very brief, uh, but to think about your questions as we go along, um, it, it's a great chance. All questions are fair. We're really lucky to have, have these folks with us today. Um, and it's a great opportunity to take advantage of their expertise and perspective um, for, for any questions really related to health disparities. Um, so also invite the panelists to ask uh, questions uh, uh, to each other as well. And we'll have 20, 25 minutes for that. So quite a bit of time. So really it's gonna be very brief, just setting the table five minutes each, unfortunately with each of these speakers. But the idea here is to then have a lot of time for discussion uh, between the panelists and for your questions. Um, more extended bios for each of the speakers um, are available online. So in the interest of time, I will be doing very brief uh, introductions. So I would like to start out with Dr. Setu Vora from the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and depending on the time zone you are in, uh, thank you for having me again for the second International COVID Conference. Um, for the session four relating to health disparities, and the lessons learned having gone through the last one year, it made me reflect as to what were the key lesson. And in speaking with other healthcare leaders within Indian country throughout Native America, one thing emerged quite clearly. And that is the fact that trust is a vital determinant 
of our collective health. And if there was one thing that was obvious right from the onset of pandemic was the fact that we needed a lot more of trust factor, not just in healthcare systems, but in just governance and our day-to-day -day interactions as well, that really would help us get through this together better. As most of you know, Native communities uh, really had disproportionate impact with COVID, both in terms of incidence as well as the mortality, perhaps due to underlying comorbid conditions that are certainly much higher as compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, and that was also seen uh, throughout uh, different tribes, tribal nations. So next slide, please. When we look at why there is a sense of mistrust, it, it really, to me uh, and to other people who are in this field, it comes down to the simple fact that when there is more trauma, there is less trust. When we have more trauma, either historic or contemporary, especially when it's with uh, you know embedded structural racism that is invisible to the majority, and those built-in barriers to uh, care and inequities are just the norm. The, the, and that's not just limited to their interaction with healthcare system, but even outside of healthcare system. That makes them really um, you know, uh, mistrustful. It makes communities of color, uh, especially native communities, a little bit more leery, mistrustful of what is going on. And that mistrust, is directed towards individuals. It could be towards institutions, uh, the information that comes out around a topic, and certainly innovations, which may be seen as either too fast or too slow. Uh, and the access to those innovations can also be questioned. Next, please. The second lesson we learned is the fact that just simply having access to care does not guarantee acceptance. And we saw that even with uh, access to initially the Abbott ID now or the Binax now rapid testing and subsequent PCR based testing, there was reluctance as to what will happen with the genetic material that is collected. Uh, we saw that even when the vaccines rolled out that just having a direct access to vaccine supply. And as most of you know, uh, majority of the tribal nations throughout U.S. had to make quick choice, a quick decision. They either could go directly with these centers of disease control and Indian Health Service to uh, secure their supply of vaccine, or they were given a choice to work with their local state partners to secure the vaccine. And just having the access to those vaccines was not guaranteed to lead to complete acceptance even if the supply was dedicated for the tribe and the tribal community. So next, please. We realized that the pandemic almost, you know, made us work over time to build or rebuild trust. But the simple fact of the matter is that trust uh, is built over time and it does take a lot of time and investment consistently, even before a crisis happens on our doorstep like it did with the pandemic. It's almost similar to one of my teachers at a mindfulness uh, retreat many years ago who said that the best time to repair a parachute is when you're on the ground. And how may we repair that parachute with, uh, with skill sets necessary for communication, understanding the individual's needs, their fears and concerns, so that when it comes time to engage them in their own healthcare, we have a trusted relationship. So it, trust, as most of us know, takes years to build and just seconds to lose. Next slide, please. So at, at Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation, and I'm, I'm sure across other tribal communities as well, building and rebuilding trust has been a challenge and a worthy challenge just not before, not just because of the pandemic, but even before that as well. And a few lessons that we learned around this topic is how may we start looking at this from a human-centered design perspective that begins with a total empathy that 
includes all the three dimensions of empathy, which certainly is the cognitive piece of empathy, uh, the emotional side of empathy, and then the compassion side of the empathy as well. How may we be transparent in our information sharing? How may we acknowledge the limits of our knowledge and say, I don't know when we don't have the answer or also share the potential that now downside to any medical intervention that we are proposing. How may we find effective storytellers from within the community that we all serve and amplify those leadership voices without title? That is the key to rebuilding trust. And it certainly requires the teamwork of both healthcare, non-healthcare leadership, uh, community leaders, uh, governance, it's an all hands on deck approach. So um, we, we really have used these uh, lessons learned over the last few months to really embrace vaccination outreach throughout the tribal nation, not just for our tribal members and families, but also for the team members and dependents that are on the tribe's self-funded health plans. Next slide, please. And Ultimately, the lesson and the mission that we all um, believe in at the Tribal Nation is to how may we build a health sovereignty model at our nation and throughout other communities that certainly focuses on health, it values the providers, it, it really has a local flavor to it, uh, there is a local control and design element that is part and parcel of the community that uh, is being served. How do we build the know-how within the community to build the pipeline of uh, the future community health workers? And finally, how do we incorporate traditional values and the emphasis on nature in this health sovereignty model? Uh, so I look forward to many more lessons learned. These are just a few that we share from the tribe at Mashantuck at Pequot Tribal Nation. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Vora. That was very interesting. And thank you for your work in this area. It's amazing to get a brief glimpse of what you're doing. And I hope we can talk about that more um, in the discussion. Um, and I'm looking forward to that time where we can be on the ground and be working to repair that parachute. I like that. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Fortuna from UCSF. Thank you very much. Um, so today I wanna to talk a little bit about, um, we're thinking about racial ethnic inequities for child and adolescent mental health during the pandemic. You can go to the next slide. Um, what we know um, in terms of COVID related stats is that what we were fearing in the, in the area of child behavioral health um, is coming to pass, that we've seen increase um, in ED visits um, related to mental health. Uh, among pediatric populations, um, which uh, has been remaining. Um, and we've also seen a proportion of mental health related visits for children aged five to 11 and 12 to 17 um, increasing respectively. And that one in four young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 have said that they've considered suicide because of the pandemic. Um, and so that is, is obviously something that's causing um, some anxiety around our nation mental health services and providers. Next. What we do also know is that the price has been higher for black and brown children. Um, you know, we know that many uh, young people of color receive the wrong services, if at all. Um, and often there's quite a bit of delay in receiving services so that they receive those services at the wrong time and also in more restrictive and punitive settings. So we know 81% of children on Medicaid are non-white and the suicide rate for black children um, has been two times that of their white peers. And that's been especially so for the younger part of our, of our children, which is five to 12 year olds. Um, and that we, they're also receiving the care, as I mentioned before, in more restrictive and punitive settings, which includes a juvenile justice system where 70% of, of youth in California JJ system um, uh, have met unmet behavioral needs and youth of color are dramatically overrepresented in that population. So there are already, we know, systemic structural issues that um, 
uh, amplify the, the negative impact of the pandemic. Next. And so making healing centered care reality isn't just tweaking the, pro the programs and trying to make them better in terms of increasing access, but actually acknowledging the role of race and poverty and how these structural issues really impact on social and emotional health for, for youth. Um, what we know is that even with the actual transmission, um, you know, Latinx minors make up 60% of, 67% of the cases of actually um, having COVID-19 illness, um, even though they're 48% of the state's population. And there's been tremendous amount of loss within their families, including elders um, and the loss of generations disproportionately again in communities of color. Next. And so we've really wanted to have the community perspective. And so working with community organizations like the um, here in the Mission District, which is the Mission Economic Development Agency, uh, working with promotoras or community health workers who are working on economic financial issues with families, but really felt that through the pandemic, what they were really seeing from um, the front line is that people were expressing a tremendous amount of need around child mental health, as well as financial issues, depression and anxiety, uh, alcohol, and then just even recovering from COVID-19 because the community had been disproportionately impacted. We're in our hospital 80% of um, the people in the ICU at the San Francisco General were of Latinx uh, and mostly immigrant population, those who ended up in the ICU. Um, and then also having unsupported education and healthcare needs and just all of that causing a lot of conflict and stress and even suicidality. So we did co uh, collaborate with the community around um, workshops and, and conversations and communications to really sort of try to build uh, appropriate information sharing, trust and engagement in people trying to think about the solutions. Next. I wanna leave us in sort of a more positive um, sort of frame, um, which I hope we can talk about more in the panel, is that I really do think we have a once in a generation opportunity to address the crisis, that the mental health crisis for children and adolescents, which was pre-existing COVID and has definitely been worsened um, and we have to take it from a social justice perspective. Um, but there's political will, I think, that is emerging around new administrations saying that they are interested and willing to engage in thinking about alternatives and ways that we can really provide services and think about the structural um, issues that are uh, impacting our youth. Um, that there is, that the, you know, in, at least in California and across the nation, there is an awareness that really we need, uh, the community is supportive, that there is a need for more mental health providers and services to, to support these needs. Next. And we are at this point where we're really looking at the impact of adversity, structural racism, and the pandemic on the social and emotional health of children. So we actually are in a tremendous advantage in this moment of really trying to think about how do we completely reform our delivery models um, that they are healing and relationship centered and trust, and that we adopt a, a concurrent paradigm shift around how do we work across systems of care, school, health, um, and other systems. Um, so I, I think I am left there. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, um, I appreciate that conclusion and agree. I mean, it's uh, Difficult, but uh, this opportunity we have, um, uh, we have to make the most of it here. Uh, so yeah, look forward to discussing that in the panel for sure. Uh, so next, I would like to introduce Dr. Mercedes Carnathan from the Feinborg School of Medicine. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to follow on the last talk uh, quite logically in talking about some of the vulnerable populations um, who have suffered disproportionately uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. And in fact, you can go ahead and just forward a few so we can just fill it in, thanks. So, you know, how do we define a vulnerable population? Uh, in that regard, it's really a population or population subgroup at a higher than average risk for having an adverse outcome. And vulnerability is context specific and dependent on the disease and setting. However, the, um, the vulnerabilities and disparities that we've seen in COVID-19 
really follow quite closely with many other major diseases, highlighting worse outcomes among uh, those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged um, across a number of different domains, including uh, race and ethnicity, um, age, um, economic, um, and economic disadvantage and resources, even neighborhoods where people live. Um, health status also predisposes to uh, disproportionately poor outcomes from COVID-19. Um, pregnant women, we were, they're, they're a vulnerable population. We're uncertain necessarily whether that translates into worse outcomes, but certainly those adults who have chronic diseases, physical and mental disabilities. Um, and then there are place-based and geographical disparities. Um, among those institutionalized, which is where we saw some of the highest rates of death among our older adults, um, prison populations, uh, the homeless, um, as well as those who are rural and isolated. Next slide. How I came to the table in this uh, discussion is that I'm a chronic disease epidemiologist. And one thing that we observed early on from the early data coming out of China were that individuals with pre-existing chronic conditions suffered worse outcomes from COVID-19. Those with cardiovascular diseases broadly defined, uh, those who had severe respiratory illnesses or who were immunocompromised. And not unsurprisingly, those categories of chronic illness are more common among many of these same vulnerable individuals. Next slide. So what makes these populations particularly vulnerable, not only to contracting COVID, severity of COVID, but also uh, developing the chronic conditions that actually underlie the uh, disproportionate risk in COVID-19. And it really is a set of complex social determinants of health. Um, clinical care being one of those, individuals from vulnerable populations, receive sometimes unequal treatment once hospitalized. They may be less likely to even seek treatment or have treatment nearby. Uh, the health behaviors that I have here highlighted in blue, these adverse health behaviors, physical inactivity, poor quality diets, uh, short non-restful sleep, these predispose to obesity and many of the chronic cardiovascular conditions that predispose to um, adverse outcomes in COVID-19. Certainly our, our physical environment and, you know, not just the physical environment, but the social environment, multi-generational households, whereby we have individuals who as essential workers are working outside the home and then come home to older adults who are at risk for worse outcomes. And then the obvious in the purple, the social and economic that I mentioned before, education, employment. Each of these social determinants of health track very closely with many of the measures that we quite often think about, such as race or ethnicity or economic wellness, but they certainly expand beyond that. Next slide. Um, one uh, you know, study just to highlight very briefly, um, emphasizing socioeconomic indicators of distress that are correlated with COVID cases and deaths. Um, and that is that those who were um, uninsured, so looking at the left panel, were more likely to experience COVID-19, uh, black um, adults in these neighborhoods, adults without a high school degree. And you can see that fatalities tracked for many of these groups with blacks, older adults, and adults without a high school degree experiencing greater rates of mortality. And this is a nationwide study of um, cases, of, of deaths and cases by county. Next slide. And so just finally to end on this point, um, because I think this is what we hear the most about, at least here in the United States, are these race-based differences, whereby we see non-white populations nearly twice as likely to experience severe um, mortality from COVID-19. This does not address what we're finding now about long-haul COVID. It also, in many cases, aggregates uh, racial and ethnic groups where there can be a very, uh, very different experience. I think the uh, Asian population here highlighted as one of those because there's a, a big group together, but there's a great deal of heterogeneity. So um, this is where we stand and I look forward as well during the discussion section about talking about positive next steps. So thank you.
Thank you so much. Appreciate that, and still stunning uh, to to see that data and see how strong those disparities are and, and what we're up against here. But appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Um, so next, we will go to Dr. Alice Mount from Stanford. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my slides here. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Alice Mao. I'm a geriatric medicine physician fellow here at Stanford and I'm pleased to um, present to you the work that my colleagues here at Stanford and I've done in understanding another segment of our vulnerable population and that is our older adults. And specifically we'll be talking about their barriers to using telemedicine in the time of the pandemic. So we all know that during the pandemic, it is very important to have access to virtual care. And it's especially important for older adults in congregate settings where it may be risky or not even feasible to leave their home to see their doctor. This is a paper that came out towards the end of last year that highlights the fact that despite increasing availability in telemedicine access, older adults are still missing their routine care appointments. This is a cross-sectional study of community dwelling older adults using a database of Medicare beneficiaries. And it estimates that 38% of those age 65 and above and 72% of those age 85 and above were not ready for video visits. And that unreadiness was more likely prevalent in those who are older, who are men, who are not married, who are minorities, such as black or Hispanic individuals, those who reside in a non-metropolitan area or those who had less education. We really wanted to understand from the perspective of older adults themselves in our own community, what they felt were the biggest barriers to accessing telemedicine and video visits. So what we did was we surveyed seniors in two independent living facilities here in Northern California, site A here in blue and site B here in orange. As you can see, the participants were on average uh, older than 80 years old and mostly female. And that at site A, most of the participants were Caucasian, English speaking, and highly educated with more than half having a postgraduate degree. Site B is a lot more heterogeneous in terms of education level, as well as their primary language spoken. And as you can see, a large majority spoke Mandarin because site B had a lot of um, Mandarin speaking immigrants. These are two pie graphs that represent respectively site A and site B, what the participants at each site told us were their biggest barriers to accessing video visits. So here over at site A, 27% of our participants said that not being familiar with the technology or the video platform was a huge barrier. 24% said difficulty hearing was a barrier to doing video visits. 10% had no device or stable internet. 8% um, said they were just not interested in seeing a provider outside of the clinic. 17% said that they had no barriers whatsoever. And then a handful of others noted memory, vision, and issues with making oneself understood um, as prominent barriers. Over here in site B, similarly, 23% said they were not familiar with technology or the platform. Unsurprisingly, an 18% said uh, not speaking English very well was a big barrier. And this was more than just finding an interpreter to communicate with their doctor, but rather that all the instructions for these video platforms were in English. So it was a high barrier of entry to even know how to navigate that. 11% said they were not interested in seeing a provider outside the clinic. 13% said they had no device or stable internet, 9% said they had difficulty hearing, and similarly, a handful of other reasons previously listed. Here are some of the themes um, from our interviews with some of these older adults, um, as well as representative quotes, which I think are really informative. Many said that telemedicine visits were very limited in that personal touch and physical exam. So a 77 year old woman said, I'd rather that the doctor can actually touch me, examine me with a stethoscope or see if a part is tender. I also think in-person communication is sometimes better for nonverbal communication for a variety of reasons, maybe just my age, I prefer face-to-face. -face. Many said that they were reluctant to use telemedicine if there was no urgent medical need. So a 79 year old Cantonese speaking woman said, I've never tried video. For telemedicine over the phone, there weren't really any big problems. My health conditions were not urgent, so I think that's why it was okay to not do a video visit. 
Many noted language barriers um, making uh, access difficult. A 74 year old Mandarin speaking woman said, if I use English, it'll be very hard. I'm comfortable with computers. I'm willing to give it a try. I'm open to medical students or other students as long as they speak Chinese. And then lastly, um, many talked about needing easier access to on-demand help. An 88 year old English uh, speaking woman said, I need a person to sit down next to me, uh, with me next to my computer to help me set up my account. Here's the icon you click on, the name of your account, where you keep your password, how you enter and use it. I need personal help. So in summary, uh, we've learned about some of the largest barriers for telemedicine access for older adults in our senior living communities. And they include difficulty with using the video platform, which can be challenging, especially since uh, each healthcare system likely has a different video platform to navigate. Language barriers, lack of device or stable internet, and a general lack of desire to see providers outside the clinic. As we've heard, these barriers are heterogeneous uh, across the board, depending on the community of seniors. So there's no one size fits all solution. Right now, we are partnering with students at Stanford, as well as community organizations in the area to provide tablet devices, as well as culturally and language concordant telemedicine training to try to bridge some of those barriers for our seniors. But we know that in order to really bridge this gap chasm of equity, we really need systems level investment in age friendly telemedicine technology on the side of our payers and as on the side of our healthcare systems. So thank you so much for your time and attention and look forward to chatting during the panel discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ma. I appreciate the, the details on this, getting into those specific barriers and also your thoughts on where we need to be going next, which we can revisit during the discussion for sure. Um, so finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elena Rios from the National Hispanic Medical Association. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, glad to be back uh, for the uh, Stanford uh, International Conference on COVID. Uh, you can go to the next slide. I uh, really just, we've already heard about disparities populations uh, for the Latino community in the United States. Uh, you know, they're uh, 60 million plus and 18% of the population and have had a, a constant uh, higher numbers, just like the African Americans, the Native Americans of compared to white uh, uh, Americans. Uh, and I'll just say that um, this has been uh, noted. And I think that the COVID-19 has really opened the mainstream eyes to, to many of the disparities that we have had for a long, a long time in our uh, working class communities. Uh, lack of, because of lack of health insurance, we have less, less access to care because of higher prevalence uh, of diseases, because of less access to care, we have less controlled chronic disease like obesity and diabetes and heart disease and cancers. Uh, we have higher exposure to COVID-19 because so many of the Latino population are low income or and essential workers who had to stay uh, working and not at home. Uh, social vulnerability index has been used now to show uh, resources to be targeted by the federal government. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but there's also problems with immigration, a lot of fear, a lot of uh, mistrust uh, and not wanting to get the vaccines or to, or to even get care uh, because uh, so many immigrants uh, had uh, major, um, I'll say major issues with the last administration, especially in the United States, uh, but also just with uh, not understanding that, uh, you know, what's going on uh, in their communities, not getting information. And then, of course, we have lots of problems with communication because of limited English proficiency, which was shown in the last slides, and, and the need for more health literacy. Next slide. So one of the positive things, though, uh, at the end of the 2020 year, when the vaccines that came from Pfizer and Moderna were uh, let, uh, you know, were approved, or just before they were approved at the end of November and early December, the Kaiser Family Foundation did a, uh, a study of, of different people in the country. And you can see uh, for the uh, Hispanic population, the black and the white population, that a lot of people were 
excited and interested in getting the vaccines. And for Hispanics, seven in 10 adults said they would get the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think this was because so many people in their families had died or had the disease and people started understanding how, of, uh, of how terrible the disease was, maybe not totally understanding what a vaccine would do or help, you know, without knowing this was before the vaccinations, uh, you know, started. Um, but it's important to know that there are a few people that are always gonna say no to a vaccine. And in our country, we have a lot of anti-vaccine uh, persons and families, but there are people also who are on the fence. And it's those people in our communities that we need to help to understand how safe the vaccines have been. Uh, they have had clinical studies with lots of minority, or, or I should say diversity within the clinical trials to show people like Black and Hispanics and uh, Native Americans, especially in Asians, that people like them were part of the studies. Next slide. So vaccine confidence has become a, a focus of many of the government's programs. And this is just some of the ways that we can improve uh, our programs uh, at the local level. Uh, we've been working with the White House COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force uh, and, and actually with the uh, health department, HHS, before the administration changed on understanding what was happening so that we could communicate information to our members. We have members around the country. We represent over 50,000 Hispanic doctors and uh, with about 20 chapters. And we are very actively uh, a communication uh, conduit uh, for providers and clinics and hospitals and academic centers who take care of uh, the community. And I think that's one of the most important things we realize that trust and transparency has to be, uh, you know, foremost in everyone's minds about uh, talking about the vaccine. I already mentioned how safe the vaccine has, the message has to be, and also having more information out there. Uh, and especially training of physicians and not just physicians, but uh, who are Hispanic, but physicians who take care of Hispanic patients or to take care of our minority patients uh, and, and having uh, reminders for them about vaccines, just like the flu vaccine and any other vaccine. And then there are social needs, and and uh, I'm, I'm not going to read all of this, but I think that's what's what's really important is people don't get vaccines for reasons that you might not think about, like not having access to childcare, not being able to leave work uh, because you don't get paid to uh, you know have a day off, and especially for our essential workers, uh, it's really hard to to understand their mindset that they are just working hard. They a very strong work, work ethic among our essential workers, especially our Latinos with large families who have to work to put food on the table and pay rent. And we have seen lots of issues uh, with COVID-19 with an economic impact that's been uh, probably as big as the, or almost as big as the Great Depression uh, that we saw in our country. Um, and next slide. So we, we've, uh, you know, just like everyone else, we have to be positive and we started a vaccinate for all campaign supported by CDC, J&J &J and Bio. Next slide. And the importance about the campaign is that it's two, training two types of, of providers, the individuals through webinars and social media and the organizations that we work with in the United States, which are the Hispanic Health Professionals Leadership Network and medical societies these are Hispanic doctors and dentists, and also working to have media training and media placement, because in our country, our, our minority uh, providers are very marginalized, and we need to get them out there as role models uh, to talk to our patients. And then the last thing I'll say is that we have a link to other COVID-19 vaccine campaigns that are national, especially with the Ad Council and with CDC, uh, and we are training doctors to become public health leaders. And uh, that program is our NHMA Leadership Fellowship Program. Uh, so I'll, I'll just stop there, but I think it's important to realize how important this COVID-19 has been to our communities 
and that we as leaders need to step up and become part of the uh, federal programs that are going to increase as a result of the disparities um, illumination, illumination uh, to the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that and, and sharing what you're working on um, now. So great. Now we have uh, about 25 minutes for um, discussion. A lot of interesting things that came up. Is everyone on video here? Someone? Yeah, no, I have everybody here, I think. Um, so I'd like to, before we get, to, there were a few comments. I didn't have too many questions yet. So everyone out there, please um, uh, send in any questions you have. Um, I thought the, so I'll start out with something for everyone, or I have, a, I have plenty of questions, but at least I'll start out with one and then I'll give you a chance to ask each other questions if you want. Um, but one of the kind of tensions here that I saw, I really liked how there was both kind of short-term things that we're doing now, um, you know, especially Dr. Mao and then uh, Dr. Rios thinking about, you know, vaccine stuff and the telemedicine and like what we can do to address as what Dr. Vora said, when we're in the air, not on the ground, repairing the parachute. But thinking about what um, Dr. Fortuna was talking about, about this opportunity we have now where there's a tension in, uh, to build for the future. So my that's a long preamble to my question, which is um, if we get past the immediate concerns of COVID, how do we bring people to continue to pay attention to this, especially for a lot of solutions that are pretty long-term? Building trust can be very, very long-term, takes a lot of time. Dealing with things like poverty and occupational um, differences can take a long time to see results. So I wonder if any of you have thoughts on sort of that balance between demonstrating to people we're having impacts and addressing their problems that they have now while also you know, keeping attention for some of these things that take a long time. I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, you know, I think as uh, Dr. Fortuna pointed out, you know, we do have an opportunity right now, given the attention being paid to the many social determinants of health, as well as just baked in forms of inequity in our society. Um, COVID-19 has certainly brought these uh, issues to the forefront. I think continuing to capitalize on those and invest in infrastructure that finds ways to get resources to people so that they can better address their health uh, needs to be a focus. I think COVID-19 certainly forced some innovations. Um, and I really appreciated what Dr. Mao had to say about telemedicine and its value and also its limitations. And I think it's just continuing to build upon some of the innovations that we have put into place right now, including our attention on these very important issues. I really appreciate that. And, and to add to what Carnathon said, I think, you know, COVID to me in the uh, sort of background of disparities is kind of like an acute exacerbation of chronic ills, right? Um, we're really seeing the seams break um, of issues that have been lingering for a really long time. Um, and so I think in some ways, this is a golden opportunity to lay uh, to continue to lay the groundwork for the things that we'll have with us forever. And so, you know, in where I sit with older adults, um, improving access to care to older adults um, will save us uh, on ED visits, will save us on hospitalizations. With the Medicare waivers right now for telemedicine and even really innovative models like hospital at home um, are really encouraging. And I think there are a lot of discussions from the side of payers to continue to um, allow for those things to happen even beyond the pandemic. Um, and I think we will be able to demonstrate both you know, lives saved and costs saved if we continue to build upon those. Yeah, I, um, I think the uh, importance of public health is something that we all realize now with the COVID-19 and, and uh, for young people to go into health careers uh, the health system uh, and public health system are here to stay. You can't outsource them. But I think the country didn't, didn't uh, you know, think highly of public health with the Affordable Care Act, for example, all that big public health fund was 
uh, you know, was eaten away. And I think that that was a big mistake and that the public and the, this country now realizes, and I think the federal government is realizing how important public health infrastructure is and that physicians and um, public health work together, especially in the community. Um, so I think that's a lesson and something for the future. Yeah, and, and I, I would just add, you know, I'm thinking more and more, we've talked about social determinants of health and I've been thinking more about policy determinants of health, right? Where, you know, I think we actually have to really push and invest as, as professionals, you know, as organizations, you know, I'm working with, with ACAP, American Academy of Child Psychiatry for the mental health of how we really have to advocate uh, for policy changes that actually change structural um, ways that our services are being provided or, or, or rep replicate barriers, right? And bias over and over again. And, and mm -hmm. we can go with it with good intention. And I think we, we have to, but we have to actually uh, transform the structures so that we can maintain those changes. And, and that's what really we're pushing. And then I think it's really important to have the community with us um, you know, I, I'm really sort of thinking about this trust piece. Um, it takes a long time, but it has to, it has to sort of what I call bring it, right? Like you have to sort of show that, you know, we're, we're in this with you and your voice is actually part of this advocacy. And we're, you know, your, your voice drives, right? How we are partnering with you around these, these systemic changes. Um, and that's a, that's a whole transformation of how we usually operate. Yeah, uh, do yeah, you want to go ahead? I think uh, in our first conference, uh, I had made the analogy that the way I see it, the pandemic is almost like a convex lens, a magnifying lens that really highlights the pre existing disparities and makes it visible to the rest of the world. At the same time, it really concentrates the power of damage and sets off fires in the community that are really at risk. Um, and Perhaps the solution does require um, really engaging with uh, non-healthcare leaders, formal, non-formal leaders in the basic tenets of public health for them to really embrace being the role of that ambassador for uh, basic public health so that they become the trusted uh, voices of the community that they live in. We found that our elders, tribal elders, were instrumental in uh, really launching the vaccination drive uh, and make it more successful than we could imagine because they got it. Uh, they understood the nuances of the vaccines. Uh, in spite of the prior trauma and mistrust, they understood that they had to overcome this. Uh, once they got it, they challenged the youth to follow suit. And in Native communities, the tribal elders have a a special place. And for us to find such informal leaders throughout our own communities is perhaps the way to really magnify the work of public health teams. It's, it's amazing to hear that because, you know, as we were talking originally, I was just thinking how, how does like a hundred years, hundreds of years of trauma, how would Will that take like hundreds of years for someone to to trust someone else again? And and it sounds like what you're saying here is it will take a long time, but there's actually that possibility, and there's more open new, openness to it than we might expect, given sort of the history. Um, and I wonder if others, you know, um, Dr. Fortuna, you talked about this organization and the mission that you work with, or even um, you know anyone else. You know, do you have any sort of more hopeful messages or examples of kind of reaching out, working with people, hearing their needs in ways really that help to build trust, which I think we're all agreeing on is really one of the critical things here. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. We, we had a similar experience where we worked with, uh, you know, local organizations that have had long-term, you know, um, credibility, right? And trust with the community. You always have to have that partnership um, you know, or organizations that have been there um, for many, many, many years, uh, advancing the, the, the economic uh, situation for immigrants and, and Latinos and 
building capacity and pipelines for, for work and everything else. And so they had all of that credibility. And so we, we partnered, you know, with sort of a community-based organization, university, and Department of Public Health um, partnership of, you know, how do we even get sort of testing, um, vaccinations, um, food to people who were, you know, economically devastated by this pandemic, um, mental health services integrated there, you know, workforce and pipeline working within sort of the mission hub center that we have here that, that has historically served a Latino and immigrant population. Um, so it definitely takes those partnerships and, um, and they, they told us that it really went a long way to build trust when, when we showed up and listened to them and helped them lead how we were gonna do this, right? And, and then they engaged the rest of the community. Um, so I agree that that's, that's, that's the way to do that. So uh, there were a few comments uh, in the, the, the Q&A that I'll just open up um, about, uh, uh, like there are some people who just do not want to get vaccinated. And there's a few questions that are just frustrating around that, um, you know, that just had really strong reasons for it. Um, I'm just maybe, especially Dr. Rios or any others, you know, how you think about that and whether there's some people that we can't reach or whether you whether you think we're just not doing something right. <laughs> no, I, I really do think that there are some people that have a decision made based on maybe some personal experience or, or just because of peer pressure. Uh, and, you know, and, and usually if it's an older adult, uh, all of their children will go along with it. I mean, you know, it's just hard to crack that, that, uh, that sense of, of decision uh, and um, they, they're not gonna, they've already made their decision, they're not gonna change their mind. It's, I think it's, what's important is that we reach out to all the people that are on the fence or that just don't know and, uh, and just try to continue to educate as many people as possible about the importance of the COVID-19 vaccine um, and give them the choice and say, you know, would you rather be hospitalized on a ventilator or, or, or die or, or in, you know, People don't realize the importance of a vaccine and the uh, the importance of getting it. What we found um, in our own community is that for some of the people who are on the fence, they were not too keen on it. Mm -hmm. uh, what resonated better with them was the fact that they may not be afraid of the virus. Uh, they may not be too worried about you know taking the vaccine because they believe it's mild, but for them to realize that they may be the carrier to the grandmother or the grandfather, and they may not want to do it for themselves because they are strong, but do it for others. And that community immunity concept did sway a few minds, I've been told. That they didn't have to do it for themselves. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So there's a, another uh, question from the audience here about how to manage, this isn't something we touched on in any, in any of the talks, but if you have thoughts on this, um, how to manage COVID-19 in sexual worker communities and drug addicts was the question. So even very marginalized communities that sometimes may not have as much interaction with the healthcare system or community health workers in some cases. You know, I think it's a it's a tough issue, but I think it still comes down to identifying vulnerable communities and using um, unique strategies to bring them the vaccine. I read recently about somebody setting up a vaccination station outside a nightclub uh, to get healthy young adults, get them where they're going. And in that case, having the flexibility of using the one shot J and J. Um, in that population, and that may or may not be appropriate in the sex worker population, given the age and sex of them. Um, however, you know, if, if it is, you know, relatively safe, that particular shot offers the most flexibility. But I think it really is uh, being able to bring the uh, vaccines to the places where hard to reach people are. Um, you know, being sick with COVID threatens their livelihood. And, you know, it's, you know, as, as uncomfortable as the discussion is about that line of work, um, they are going to engage in that line of work. And when they have to step back from it, it has very real implications for them financially and for their families. And so just really emphasizing the need to protect themselves 
as they continue their work would be critical. Right, and then I, I would just add, I mean, um, here at San Francisco General Hospital, we have several programs, right, that, that do uh, substance use services, um, intensive case management to homeless populations, which have significant substance use. And, and I'm just going to go back to that sort of idea of, you know, build a parachute when you're, when you're on the ground. I think the fact that we have this sort of network of support and services that we actually bring out into the community, embedded into the community, you know, including reaching out to the homeless people in street medicine, um, you know, having a methadone program where we do a lot of sort of, you know, wraparound intensive case management, those then all become the venues, right, by which we engage those communities in other parts of healthcare, which includes vaccination or responding to crisis and disaster and the things that they need. Um, even sort of when people were hoteled because they were homeless, um, we were going out and doing their substance use services to those hotels so that they wouldn't have to come out and not be sheltered in place, bringing them food. And then we added the vaccine when it was time to add the vaccine. So you kind of have to think before the issues are at hand, like something like vaccination, and then you build upon those, those structures, right, to be able to do public health measures. Um, which is what we're, we're trying to do. And, and a lot of these services that exist for these populations, that's where we have to build upon uh, a vaccination plan. Mm -hmm. There's a really nice article by um, Laura Specker Sullivan that really resonated with me personally that, and she outlines, you know, a few key elements of building or rebuilding trust amongst, uh, you know, communities that have undergone trauma and disparities. Uh, and it comes down to being able to communicate empathetically, uh, showing that we understand their concerns, that comprehension piece, uh, demonstrating competence in whatever public health or medical offering we have to share with them, and then finally do it in a caring manner. Um, perhaps all healthcare professional schools will start, uh, you know, human-centered design, perhaps motivational interviewing, uh, medical humanities, uh, those soft skills perhaps are more necessary, uh, equally necessary as compared to the basic science research and uh, clinical critical skills that we learned. I'll just put in a last plug for community partners that have been in those communities for decades, have built those trusts and are doing the work. Um, in my prior life as a primary care doctor at a county hospital, um, I got to work with um, a lot of needle exchange programs and uh, those folks have had you know, immense uh, trust from the community members that they serve with substance use disorders. And so in some ways traveling, instead of inviting folks into our ivory towers, but traveling to those communities um, and really understanding the expertise of our community partners and continuing to provide resources and support is important. Yeah, I, I think one other aspect of working in a community is uh, not ha never having enough resources because community agencies uh, tend to be smaller. And I think what's important is we start realizing how to connect the community agencies together uh, with some type of more local planning, healthcare planning, uh, where healthcare uh, should connect to social services. You know, the, the whole patient-centered uh, home model is based on having a, the patient at the center with all the services that it needs, but, uh, you know, one clinic or one hospital can't do it. And, and all the social services in a community are really usually led by different types of agencies, whether they're funded by the housing or, or, or by SAMHSA for mental health and there's got to be a way to come together and, and have a more uh, community focused health planning resources. I think that's the future. Yeah, about four years ago in Connecticut, in Southeast Connecticut, where the tribe is, we were one of the founding partners for the Eastern Connecticut Health Collaborative, which mm. Dr. Rios just describes that acute care healthcare systems with the CBOs, mm -hmm. even school districts and governance offices, mayor's office, first selectmen. Mm -hmm to mm -hmm. really come together to have a, a strategic plan for the region. Mm -hmm. And I think that type of personal relationships that were built came in really handy in executing uh, testing, isolation, support services during this pandemic. 
I'm curious. That's a great example. Thanks for it. I'm curious how that happened. Was it one? Was it someone sort of higher up in the government? Did it start from a particular organization? I know a lot of people kind of see that as important, but face challenges in actually bringing folks together. We started that uh, when I, I had my role in a more, you know, hospital-based system, uh, but we made it very clear transition to hand off the ownership and leadership, not to the acute care system, but to uh, a, a, you know, impartial body that doesn't really have an interest in uh, services necessarily going up. Uh, it's more about truly population health. Uh, so we have United Ways currently as our, as our anchor spine institute, uh, pulling together these uh, collaborative uh, partners. Thank you. Did I, I, I said that I was gonna give you a chance to ask questions to each other. Did any of you have any questions you wanted to each other, ask each other in the last few minutes here? I, I have one question to just ask uh, uh, Setu, uh, your collaborative in terms of funding from the government, whatever state or local or federal, uh, how do you get rid of the concept of, of silos and how this is what I've heard from community organizations that they think there needs to be a change in the concept that every, every government agency has their own standards or their own grant mechanisms, their own, you know, and how do you deal with that? How do you make things more flexible for the community organization running this, like the umbrella organization. I don't know if that's the United Way or. That or is who. the United Way for us now. Mm -hmm. In my prior role, we were the uh, sponsor organization, so to speak. Um, but yes, essentially it comes down to having the state partners at DPH and the governor's office you know, align with uh, this health enhancement community model so that we net, not always rely on grant funding, but then we are able to generate enough sustainability within our you know, catchment area of people that we serve, that people, CBOs find value in this uh, partnership. They find value in investing their staff time and resources because they're able to connect people to care, get more referrals and uh, execute faster. So it becomes a little bit more self-sustaining. Right. Well, thank you all so much. That was a really helpful discussion and I appreciate first all of the work that each of you are doing um, and then also for sharing with us today. So thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this session.